Okay, uh, welcome everybody. I uh, appreciate everyone taking the time this morning uh, to learn a little bit about what the MASA team at the University of Michigan is, uh, is working on and uh, some support uh, we might be able to provide as a lift uh, ecosystem. Uh, obviously as a public-private partnership and one of the National Manufacturing Innovation Institutes, uh, it is our mission to uh, help advance uh, technology uh, but also help advance uh, the talent that is in, that is involved, and these students are certainly uh, certainly leading the way when it comes to uh, when it comes to that talent for engineering and advanced manufacturing as they attempt uh, a launch into space. Uh, and they will uh, they will uh, talk to us about that in just a uh, just a second. So if everyone can put their uh, their phones on on mute or their computers on mute, that'd be great. Uh, we are recording this session so we can share it with uh, with other Lyft members and and. Uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, folks within the DOD and even the, uh, the Space Force with the federal government to let them know what the, uh, what the MASA team uh, is working on. Full disclosure, I am a Michigan State graduate, but I'm certainly uh, happy to, uh, to help out our friends at the University of Michigan uh, through this, uh, this, program, um, this program that's going on uh, today and the, uh, the, the, the process that they're going on to, uh, to launch into space. Uh, we just won't talk about Saturday, but today we will be uh, we will be very good friends and uh, and talk about uh, and talk through this. So, with without any further ado, I will hand it over to the um, to the University of Michigan team. They will go through their presentation. Then we'll open up to Q and A afterwards and uh, and discuss how how we as a as a lift team can help. So, U of M team, Tommy and, and group, it is uh, it is uh, it is up to you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, thank you, Joe, for organizing this. Um, so we're MASA, we're the student rocketry team at the University of Michigan. And today we're gonna to talk to you about our, our team, our project, um, and how you can help. I am uh, Teo, I'm the current president of the team. Um, and you'll hear tonight from, from some of our uh, other leads. who are gonna each talk about their specific um, specialty. So uh, what is our team? We uh, are the uh, Michigan Aeronautical Science Association. We're made up of about 70 to 80 students at the University of Michigan both graduate and undergraduate, and from a whole set of different majors. Um, we truly are an interdisciplinary team, um, and we try to design all the subsystems on our vehicles um, yeah, fully in-house. Uh, our goal right now is to uh, build, test, and fly liquid bipropellant rockets. Um, and we are broken into seven sub-teams, each of which is in charge of a specific set of subsystems on the vehicle, um, uh, and then we integrate that into a, a, a rocket. And currently our subteams are aerodynamics and recovery, assembly, test and launch operations, avionics, production, propulsion, structures, and business development. You'll hear a lot more from um, about the projects that are being uh, worked on by each of these subteams tonight uh, and how you can help um, uh, with manufacturing um, and the other uh, kind of help we're looking for. So we were founded in 2003, um, and we have been steadily increasing the level of difficulty of our projects since then. We started off doing mostly solid propellant vehicles. So that's ones where you have both the fuel and oxidizer combined in a solid fuel drain. Um, and those are usually the simplest type of rocket, especially since um, usually you, you can get your hands on a commercial off the shelf engine of that style pretty easily. So that is how we started off as a team. Um, since then, we've been taking on increasingly challenging projects. We moved to hybrid vehicles sometime, sometime in 2015. Um, that's where you have a, a, a liquid oxidizer, which is being sprayed onto the solid fuel. Um, and the culmination of that project was the Tortoise 8 vehicle in 2017, which we launched at Spaceport America Cup, uh, and we won the first place overall. Um, after that, we moved on to liquid bipropellant rockets. Um, those are where you have both the fuel and the oxidizer as a liquid, and this is comparable to a lot of commercial rockets, such as the SpaceX Falcon 9, for example. Um, and we were actually the first student team to ever build and launch uh, a rocket of that type um, at Space Boy Rocket Cup in 2018 with Laika. Uh, we're continuing with our liquid by propellant rockets. We're currently uh, building the Tangerine Space Machine, which is our answer to the Base 11 Space Challenge, which challenges student teams to send a single stage liquid by propellant rocket to the edge of space by 2021. Um, so that's what we're currently working on, um, and that is a liquid uh, bipropellant rocket, as I mentioned, which uses uh, RP-1, which is a refined kerosene, along with uh, liquid oxygen as the propellants. 
So you've learned a little bit about the team. Uh, next, we're going to talk about our, our current project, which is the Tandering Space Machine, in a little bit more detail. And then, as I mentioned, we're going to uh, break it down by subteam um, and look at the various projects where we might uh, need manufacturing help. And then more concretely, if you wanted to, how you can help NASA achieve our goals of reaching space. The picture there on the right of the screen is PT-163, which is one of our experimental engines that we uh, tested last year on its test stand in Ann Arbor, and we'll see more about that uh, in a second. Okay, so our Vice President, uh, Julia, is now going to talk about uh, our current project. Yeah, hi everyone. So now we're going to delve a little bit deeper into the, the Tangerine Space Machine project. So we are currently competing in the Base 11 Space Challenge for a $1 million prize, as Teo mentioned. And um, in order to achieve this mission, uh, we have to launch a liquid bipropellant rocket to the edge of space and be the first collegiate team to do so. And we are building the Tangerine Space, machi space Machine to fulfill these requirements and to win the competition. And you can see on the image on the right, um, how much larger our current rocket is than our previous projects. So this is a huge feat for the team and we're really excited about uh, where we're going. So our team is targeting to launch in December of 2021 and we are currently leading the Base 11 competition as we were awarded the best preliminary design report in June of 2019. We also currently hold the record for building the most powerful student built rock liquid rocket engine and we included a clip from one of our recent hot fires where you can see the engine firing and this is always a big accomplishment and super exciting for our team. So the Tangerine space, space Machine is 26 feet tall and at liftoff the engine will produce over 4,000 pounds of force making our engine by far the most powerful liquid engine ever built by a student team. After 41 and a half seconds and burning 830 pounds of propellant, the engine will burn out propelling TSM to over five and a half times the speed of sound. At T plus three and a half minutes, TSM will reach space and deploy a payload being designed by another Michigan organization and TSM's recovery system. 10 minutes after launch, TSM will softly touch down in New Mexico at around 11 miles per hour under our parachutes. And here we have a nice graphic of our previous achievements along with what we have planned coming up. Over the past few years, we have come really far performing three hot fire tests, a burst test, winning phase one of the challenge, producing test articles for both air structures and recovery, and revamping our recovery system. And we also have a lot planned for this upcoming year, despite any COVID setbacks. And now we'll delve a little bit deeper into our specific subteams. Um, and first is our aerodynamics and recovery lead, uh, Eddie. Yeah, so I'm Eddie, I'm the A&R lead. So we're responsible for a number of things. The first being on the next slide. So this is one of the first things we're responsible for, which is flight simulation. So <clears throat> to give a quick explanation of what MathTran is, it's essentially our own in-house developed Six Degrees of Freedom flight simulator that we've developed in MATLAB. So our problem right now is that publicly available amateur rocketry flight simulators aren't really able to accurately simulate our regime. Most of them are solid rocket engine simulations. They have really static parachute models where they have inaccurate high mock aerodynamics and no, none of the Monte Carlo we actually require. So we decided to build our own. So MassTran essentially includes all of these features such as liquid engine simulation, how it impacts our center of gravity and center of pressure, three, three degrees of freedom dynamic parachute modeling, our supersonic and hypersonic stability calcs, live wind data we can import from the NOAA and even more so Monte Carlo variation such as tolerancing effects, aerodynamic coefficients, rocket parameters, and wind data, and et cetera. So that's one of the fields we're responsible for. The next field we're responsible for is aerodynamic surfaces. So one of these is the nose cone of our rocket. So right now we're in the process of finishing up our CAD design for the nose cone. 
Right now it's a rolled plate design with internal scaffolding. We have a titanium tip bolted in on the top, as you can see on the right figure with an aluminum spacer. The internal scaffolding is, con is consisted of rings and ribs. The ribs themselves are half circle protrusions and the rings will also hug the skin. So one of the things we've done was our nose skin is that we've also done thermal simulations using CFD, uh, transient CFD simulation to try and simulate the thermals that would happen on our nose skin during flight. So current simulations show roughly around 500 degrees C on our nose comb tip. So because of this, we've made a switch to from our material to titanium. So as for manufacturing, our first goal is probably, we want to get as much as is done in-house as possible from us, but there are some things that we can't get done in-house. One of them being probably CNC machining for the titanium tip. Along with that, uh, most of the other things we can do in-house though, such as CNC machining for our scaffolding, spacer top ring, middle ring, and also rolling for the sheet metal, both the lower and upper sections. Moving on to the next slide, we'll talk about our next aerodynamic surface, which is the, fin, the fins. So our fins components are also completely designed by us and are in the current process of being simulated and finalized on a CAD design. So our fins are designed to essentially provide us a stability margin of better than two cows throughout our entire flight. And our fins are also designed to prevent flutter in the fins. So our interface was our fins and main chassis is still something that's ongoing. Right now it's a fin can bolted design. So beyond that, we're also running some coupled transient CFD and FEA. So if you can see in that slide and that figure on the right, Teo, if you actually wanna click on the video. Not sure how well it will show, but we've managed to get a CFD and FEA coupled sim running. So we wanna try and use that to try and simulate fin flutter. So talking about manufacturing, most of these, well, again, like the Nemozco, we'll try and get as much done in-house as possible, such as CNC machining for our structural ribs and sheet metal bending for outer skin. However, one of the problems we do end up with is uh, CNC machining for our leading and trailing edges. We haven't gone thermal sims for our leading edge for our fins yet, but just based off extrapolation, we're, get, we're gonna guess that it's around 500 degrees C as well, similar to our nose cone. So that may require a titanium leading edge, it may not, we're not sure. We still need to do more analysis on that. Moving on to the next slide, we'll talk about our final aerodynamics and recovery subproject. So this is essentially our recovery and payload overview. So to talk about a recovery system, our, app, our rocket uses a three shoot system that deploys at Apogee in order to slow us down to a descent rate of 21 feet per second. If you can see on the figure on the right, you can see our recovery profile where we deploy a pilot chute at Apogee after nose cone separation. From there, we deploy a drogue chute that is dragged out by our pilot chute and then a main chute that deploys at 3000 feet, which is dragged out by our drogue chute. And this is all done using a system of line cutters. Our nose cone also fully separates, uh, hold on a second. Our nose cone also fully separates and it contains a payload that is being developed by one of the classes here at U of M called Aero 495. O495 is a CubeSat and its purpose is to essentially test sensors and altitude control systems that they're currently implementing. And our final topic is our separation mech, which is essentially what separates out our nose cone from the main body of our rocket. And it's a pneumatic system, which uses, releases two sets of redundant bolts. So what do we actually need for manufacturing on this mechanism? Well, most of this we can do in house. A lot of these are just CNC machining for our SEP mech and then water jetting, rolling and welding for our sheet metal of sheet metal for our recovery bay and our recovery bay mortars. So that's all the topics I have for a &R. Moving on to propulsion, I'll let Akil take this. Hey, uh, hi, I'm Akil. I am the team's treasurer and the injector design lead and I'll be covering the propulsion sub team. Right, so Teo mentioned before, uh, PT-163 is a non-flight engine designed to TSM's initial specifications. We hot-fired PT-163 several times, topping off at 2650 uh, pounds of thrust and breaking the collegiate liquid rocket engine thrust record. Uh, the majority of PT-163's manufacturing was done using manual mill and lathe operations through the university student team project center. However, the data we received from the engine greatly influ influenced our future design endeavors for RPD2, our flight engine. 
So RPD2 is comprised of four main components, the chamber, the nozzle, the injector, and the main propellant valves. I will give a brief overview of each of these components and their manufacturing processes in the next uh, couple slides. RPD2 is designed for a better performance, easier assembly, and integration with flight systems. And with the added complexity of the engine, we require more advanced manufacturing techniques. The chamber is uh, designed to be made from Inconel 718, and it is designed to distribute fuel evenly through a regen cooling manifold, while also facilitating a stable combustion. The flow path of the fuel is shown in the cross-section view, and the chamber is currently scheduled to be fully 3D printed, uh, along with electrical discharge machining operations to make small holes underneath for film cooling. And that just uh, that process is just making sure that the fuel is used to actually cool down the outer walls uh, of the engine so we don't get too hot. And the nozzle is currently designed from uh, titanium with a zirconium oxide coating to withstand the heat while also optimally expanding the combustion products. For the current nozzle, we are opting for a CNC lathe manufacturing, but for future massa nozzles and chambers, we are looking into metal spinning and large 3D printing suppliers, as well as sinker and fast hole EDM for film cooling. The injector is designed to make a fine mist of the fuel and oxidizer by colliding the two streams, similar to a shower head. Uh, the precision and tolerances of this component are essential to an efficient combustion that also minimizes the system pressure drops. And as for manufacturing methods, used, it is primarily CNC machining, as well as brazing and welding for securing the separate parts together. In addition to CNC machining, we are looking to use EDM operations to precisely machine the angled holes seen in the injector face. And for future massa injectors, vacuum brazing and electropating would be pivotal in reducing the corrosive effects during brazing or any furnace treating operations. Right, here are the two main propellant valves for the rocket. It's one for each propellant, liquid oxygen and RP1, and uh, they're responsible for controlling the flow of the propellant oxidizer to the engine. And through the application of pneumatic gas, the valves are closed uh, with a piston and a machine sealing surface. For initial valve prototypes, we actually have a picture in the bottom of our uh, manufacturing of our fuel valve, which is primarily done using manual mill and lathe operations. And for future iterations uh, of the valve, we are looking to increase the mass savings as it goes on the actual rocket. And to do so, we are looking for CNC mill and lathe suppliers, as well as welding operations that minimize the warping of the materials, such as laser welding, and then some forms using TIG and MIG. All right, and next, Alfonso, our outlaw lead, will, co will cover our assembly test and launch operations sub-team. Uh, hello, yes, I'm Alfonso. As Akil said, I'm the outlaw lead, responsible for assembling ground equipment and working with sub-teams like propulsion and structures to test uh, the engine and tanks, which we did a burst test of last year. And hopefully in a year from now, we'll be responsible for the launch operations on the rocket. So currently we have two main pieces of ground support equipment. We have the fill system, which you can see in the bottom left, and the medium duration tank stand, which you can see on the right. And the fill system controls our supply of pressure and cryogenics into the eight second tank stand. So we use it to remotely pressurize our COPV or CNG tank in the middle and to remotely fill the oxygen tank with locks. Uh, and it will also be used to supply the rocket while it's on the pad. And our medium duration tank stand, which was built last year, uh, supports our engine tests, including cold flows and hot fires. And it's actually what was used during our record breaking hot fire uh, in February of this year. In the future, we plan to construct a much larger, um, more similar to flight piece of ground equipment called the full duration tank stand, which will support the full 41 and a half seconds of burn. Um, and we'll also use it for cold flows to verify that the GSC is working as it should. It will use the flight tanks and we'll be conducting tests at Friends of Amateur Rocketry in California, which is an amateur rocketry test and launch site. 
Uh, in the bottom left there, you can actually see the launch rail that we'll use to launch and a vertical test stand that we might use to test our engine. And in the bottom right, you can see our new engine mounting structure with RPD2. Um, and that's the configuration that will be used either on a horizontal test stand at FAR or in our bunker for full duration cold flows. On the rocket, we're obviously going to need a lot of plumbing to move fluids around. Uh, this plumbing is going to be responsible for feeding the engine properly with propellants, for pressurizing the tanks, and for supplying components like the main propellant valves with actuation pressure. And it has to do so safely, efficiently, uh, while also providing us all the capabilities that we need to work with the rocket while it's on the pad. This is where most of our manufacturing needs lie. Um, so the precise bending and flaring of, of large tubes uh, and bending them with really small radii uh, would be extremely helpful to us. So things like CNC tube benders, um, and potentially also welding tube, uh, getting custom cryogenic flex hoses, welding flex hoses to tube, um, those kinds of things. So as you can see in the, that picture on the right, we have that one and a quarter inch tube with two 90 degree bends very close to each other with small bend radii. That's not something we can do ourselves. Um, so getting CNC manufacturing for tubes would be extremely beneficial. We also benefit from material sponsorships since a lot of what we do simply involves uh, you know, buying components and assembling them. So things like fittings, uh, components, valves, and also sensors like transducers would be greatly helpful. Next, we'll talk about our structures on the rocket. Yeah, so uh, the main, the largest components on the rocket are the structures components. And these include um, everything from basically the end of the nose cone to uh, where the engine connects to the vehicle. Uh, the single largest component on the vehicle are of course the propellant tanks. Uh, we're using a tanks as airframe design, which means that the exterior of each of our tanks is also the exterior of the rocket. Uh, the tanks themselves um, have a pretty simple uh, design where we have end caps on either end. These are CNC uh, milled and a rolled piece of sheet metal between them, which is welded along the seam and welded to each, each end cap. Um, we performed a burst test of a prototype of one of these tanks uh, in our bunker this past year. Um, and this uh, helped us learn a lot about uh, welding uh, along a very long uh, seam weld like this um, and about also the heat treating process that we use on the tanks. Uh, you can see pictures of the end caps um, and the burst test and also a cross section of the tank on the slide. Some other features of note are the, is the baffling that we use throughout the tank. So we use annular uh, rings that are welded to the inside of the tank to mitigate propellant slosh and along a similar vein uh, inside the bottom end caps, we have anti-vortex baffling um, to ensure that the uh, engine is always being fed uh, by propellant. The um, specific manufacturing needs that we need uh, to be able to manufacture these tanks uh, are large format sheet metal rolling um, are along with uh, technologies to weld the seam. We've traditionally used uh, TIG welding, uh, but we are looking into friction stir welding. So if um, anybody listening has any contacts in friction stir welding that they could put us in touch with, that would be extremely beneficial to us. Uh, also, um, we weld the slosh baffles, the vortex baffles, the end caps, and the, TIG, uh, and the uh, end cap fittings uh, with TIG welding. Um, and we are currently are uh, also looking for a welder. Other processes that we use are the um, solution heat treating, artificial aging, and annealing uh, for the tank. Um, and this is also hard to find a place to manufacture because of the large format. Um, and finally, CNC machining of the end caps. Now, Julia will talk about the uh, thrust transfer structure. Yeah, so the purpose of the thrust transfer structure is to attach the engine to the rest of the, of the rocket, as well as effectively transfer the thrust to the rocket. And as you can see in the images, especially that top right one, um, we're using a clevis rod end design and then having the bottom ring bolt into our upper engine ring, and then the upper clevises will be welded directly onto our propellant tank bottom end cap. In terms of machining, we would like to have the clevises and rod caps machined on the CNC. Um, then the clevises must be welded onto the end cap pads and to the engine mount ring. Lastly, the threaded rod cap seen in that bottom right picture will require a thin weld to those rods. And we are looking to get tight tol tolerances on these components. So having more experienced machinists would definitely go a long way in making sure that we reach our tolerances. 
All right, um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the raceway in the rocket. So early on in the design, we decided not to pass the um, propellant lines through uh, one of the tanks. So instead we decided um, to pass them outside the rocket in a raceway. So both raceways, uh, two on the rocket, the LOX raceway and the avionics and pneumatics raceway are made out of 6061 aluminum. Um, and they're used to route um, propellants as well as uh, pneumatics and also uh, any wires and harnessing for avionics. Um, so the fairing plows are welded to the rocket airframe and then uh, hopefully CNC'd to get a nice uh, aerodynamic shape. Um, we also hope to roll uh, the uh, kind of uh, half cylinder section of the uh, raceway um, and also have that welded to the airframe. So uh, this part requires some CNC machining of both the fairing plows, uh, the front and the back. Um, also some CNC machining of, uh, and rolling of the uh, metal fairing um, and sheath that goes on it, and then uh, welding the whole thing to the repellent tanks at the end of it. Next, we are going to talk about avionics. Um, so uh, first up, a little bit overview of our avionics sub-team. Um, so avionics overall is supposed to monitor the state and location of the rocket, uh, both like on the ground and during flight, uh, and send and store data uh, to the rocket. Uh, sorry, send and store data from mission control to the rocket. And also there, um, all the engine controllers and pressurization boards will move fluids around the rocket and turn the engine on and off. Uh, they're also, one of the big things is maintaining tank pressure and also deploying the parachute and nose cone uh, for the recovery systems. Um, next we have active tank pressurization, which is one of the most um, pressing projects Avionics is currently working on. Uh, so that's a um, system that will be uh, controlling the both propellant tank pressures uh, during the burn. So obviously as propellant drains from the tanks, we need to uh, supply gas to make sure uh, the tank remains pressurized. Um, we have designed a tank pressurization controller, uh, which basically uh, controls the needle valve that's spun by a motor uh, and that helps monitor uh, or control the flow rate into the tanks. Um, we're using helium to pressurize the tanks, by the way. Um, so we did some successful proof of concept testing uh, done on a small scale last semester. And currently this semester we're doing some larger scale tests and also bringing up that board uh, you see at the bottom there. Um, so we're uh, soldering on all the components for that. Um, coming up, we're gonna do some full scale testing with some of the stands Alfonso was talking about and hopefully um, be able to verify that the system works um, by the end of the semester or the beginning of next semester. And then last we have telemetry, GPS and PTCB design. Um, so we have a patch antenna um, that will be going on the rocket and that will help communicate any of the telemetry down to the ground uh, during flight. So we're currently running simulations uh, to help guide the frequency selection and also component selection for that. Um, like I said, uh, telemetry will be received by mission control and also White Sands missile range, uh, which will be tracking the rocket during our flight. And we're also hoping to get an unlocked GPS um, to provide accurate uh, location uh, data for the rocket during the entire burn. Uh, also currently going on is a lot of PCB design for our engine controller, pressurization board, uh, flight computer, um, black boxes and other boards that are going on the rocket. Um, so in terms of manufacturing, um, most of what we do for avionics is in-house software and we also do a lot of our soldering, but um, we're trying to source or manufacture uh, the cylindrical patch antenna for the rocket because that's a very high tolerance and um, needs to be very precise for the, the band and stuff we're using. And then also uh, a lot of what we do is um, PCB bring up, as we said. So um, just finding people to fabricate those PCBs and also do surface mount soldering uh, on them. Uh, next up, we have Tommy, who is going to be talking about uh, how you can help master reach space. Yes, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about sponsoring the team and, and what benefits that might provide for you in addition to just being generous. <laughs> so uh, manufacturing is a really big ticket item right now. You've heard a lot about um, some things that we can do in-house out of and things that we need done out of house. Um, COVID guidelines have put a lot of restriction on our use of the machine shop uh, in terms of how frequently we can be in the machine shop and for how long we can be in the machine shop. Um, on top of that, about a third of our team is um, off campus doing remote learning. Uh, so our in-house manufacturing capability has been diminished, not because we can't do it, just because we don't have enough time in the machine shop. Um, another big ticket item is materials. It's one of the more popular sponsorship items or methods of sponsoring the team. We receive a lot of uh, raw metal stocks, uh, and avionics connectors, anything that we need to uh, build the physical rocket, we're always happy to receive uh, as a sponsored item. 
uh, monetary support. We don't usually push for monetary support, but we're in kind of a unique situation right now. Uh, the aerospace department at Michigan has set aside $25,000 for us, which is the most that they uh, have ever set aside for us. But there is the catch that we have to raise uh, an additional $5,000 in uh, cash sponsorship from sponsors that are not currently listed as a sponsor. Uh, so if a cash sponsorship was something that uh, you may be interested in, uh, if you could help us get to that $5,000 mark, you wouldn't just be helping us raise $5,000, but uh, you'd be raising as much as $30,000 uh, with us. Another reason that's important is a lot of our upcoming expenses are cash dependent, uh, mainly our travel to Friends of Amateur Rocketry in California or Spaceport America. Um, Lunum stock is still not being accepted as payment at Motel 6. I wish it was, but we are going to need cash for our travel. Uh, so when you sponsor Massa, so we consider you a part of the team. Um, and so you or your company will be uh, a part of the first student-led team to send a bipropellant rocket to space. I don't think I need to tell you that that's a, a big deal. Uh, you're Com your company's logo will be on the vehicles, on all of our merch. Um, this year with COVID, one of our big initiatives uh, on the business end of the team is to expand our social media and online exposure for ourselves and our sponsors. Um, but it's not just us that will be promoting you. We've had large companies like Dassault Systems uh, at their very own conference highlight Massa uh, using our footage from our hot fire tests and our live streams where we have banners with all of our sponsors proudly displayed. Um, they use that footage at their own conference. Uh, and so you get exposure in industry from other companies as well. Uh, you also get access to some of the top tier engineering students from U of M and I'm probably a little bit biased, but Michigan is known for producing some of the best engineers in the world. And on top of that, the students on Massa uh, have a ton of practical experience in probably one of the most challenging competitions uh, in the engineering world. Uh, so you'll get access to a resume book with all of our members across all the different disciplines, not just engineering, but computer science, everyone on the team. And the big one, tax benefits. Massa is a 501c3 nonprofit. So any sponsorship or donation uh, is a tax deductible expense. Uh, so every chance we get, we say thank you to our sponsors. We obviously can't do any of it without them. Completely dependent on sponsors and donations. So uh, we always thank our sponsors. Hopefully over the next couple of weeks, we can add a couple of you to the sponsor list. Uh, but either way, um, thank you for coming. You've heard a lot about the things that you may be able to do to help us. Even if you're not in a position to sponsor or support the team at the moment, uh, you may have heard something in the presentation that reminded you of someone that you may know that may be able to help us. We're always in the market for contacts, whether it's for sponsorships or someone that we can just work with in the future. Uh, so thank you, Joe, for organizing this. Thank you, everyone, for attending.